So good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome uh, to another special edition of the uh, Soaring Society of Boulder Ground School. Uh, we've got something a little out of the ordinary uh, uh, this evening, and that is a, uh, uh, a jet-powered self-launch glider. And I'm not sure how many there are in the world. Uh, I know there's one because I've, I've, I've seen it, and I've seen it launch. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, hopefully Chris, uh, our guest speaker is Chris Esselton, and uh, hopefully he'll talk about, uh, he, he's definitely going to talk about the, his glider, but uh, he may give us some insight into if anybody else has, has been able to achieve uh, what, he, what he is, what he's done. Yeah, Chris is a, is a, is a, tool, a tool and die maker. Uh, he had a career uh, and got pretty advanced in, in how to make uh, sophisticated things, uh, both you know, on a on a special scale and on a and on a large scale. Um, his father was a pilot also and a, and a tool maker as well. Uh, built a uh, RS-15 glider. Uh, Chris helped, and and that kind of got him interested in in aviation. Um, it was a twin engine uh, model. Um, he got his private pilot's license at 19. And then decided to build airplanes. Uh, met Bert Raton, uh, I guess at Oshkosh. Uh, built a home-built uh, airplane himself. Um, built a cozy, a side-by-side -side, uh, uh, ship. Uh, flew that for he's got 1,100 hours. Um, and uh, he built another cozy. Put 180 horsepower retractable. He just he just keeps going. He just keeps doing this sort of thing, uh, and he designed a uh, a variation on that design. So he's not afraid to take a kit and make it better. Um, and he put a six a six cylinder engine in, uh, and uh, changed the airfoil design. Uh, made it IFR. It goes two hundred knots. Um, uh, can fly to twenty five thousand feet. Uh, and uh, his, his average speed, he's uh, done a speed of 271 knots over 500 mile course. So, um, but then, you know, he transitioned to soaring. He, he got, uh, 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 you know, had a, did what he wanted in airplanes, decided soaring was more interested. So he loves building home, home built aircraft. And he built an HP 18. Uh, he installed turbines uh, in it, uh, new, new airfoil. All that, but really that and, and what we have here talking about and what we saw out at uh, at the Boulder Airfield uh, late last week was an ASW 27, uh, and he turned it into a, he took a uh, scrapped crashed uh, AS 27, uh, did a three year project, and for those of you who've seen the video with the launch, it's it's uh, pretty interesting to see that uh, see that glider roll down the runway and, and get up into the, and uh, gain speed and then uh, climb away. Uh, so it's a three-year project for his ASW 27. Uh, so with that, I want to introduce uh, Chris Esselton. And uh, Chris, please, uh, please tell us about uh, your ASW 27 with the jet engines. Sure thing. Uh, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen here. And uh... There we go. There we go. All right. Uh, so thank you, Armand. Yes, uh, presentation tonight is on the uh, uh, rebuild of a uh, ASW 27 uh, with the incorporation of a, a number of different uh, uh, things, uh, primarily being uh, the turbine engines. Uh, I'll go through a little bit of history, how I uh, became uh, interested in aviation. Um, once again, as Armin said, I was a, a tool engineer uh, for a company called Versivo back in uh, the Midwest uh, in Wisconsin, uh, tool and die manufacturing industry. Uh, I have hands-on experience as a pattern maker and a tool and die background, and all the composites work that uh, I have uh, uh, learned over the years have been essentially self-taught, uh, primarily building a rutan design aircraft. Uh, ratings, I have a uh, single engine land instrument rating, glider rating, 
I've got about 3,500 hours accumulated uh, flying time and power and about 500 additional in gliders. Uh, so I've been flying gliders for the last uh, 12 years here and um, mostly with uh, uh, the club gliders, the HP-18 uh, that I had built and uh, the ASW-27. Uh, so my passion is building and flying experimental aircraft. Um, I am more of a builder than a flyer, uh, but I'm learning more and more about the soaring uh, uh, business as I go along and uh, it's, uh, it's just wonderful. Uh, so here's a couple of the first couple airplanes that I built. The one on the right is a, a Quickie. That was a Rutan design, had an 18 horsepower Onan industrial engine. I flew that for about 300 hours and then I got married and built the airplane on the left. And that is a, a, a Cozy 3. That was a side-by-side -side version with a third seat in the back. Uh, I like the mannerisms of the canard so much, the stall resistance, spin resistance, uh, efficiency, uh, speeds, that I decided to build a, uh, another Cozy. Uh, this one right here has a lot of my own uh, ideas into it. Uh, essentially, I put an IO540 engine instead of a uh, 0360 engine in it. Uh, it's a six cylinder, 260 horsepower. Uh, for the added extra weight on the tail end of the fuselage, which was 110 pounds, I stretched the uh, fuselage by 12 inches. So uh, the uh, pilot and co-pilot uh, are sitting that much further forward to counteract for the balance. Um, in addition, now I had this uh, big engine in there and I wanted it to go fast. Well, instead of throwing more horsepower at it, I uh, decided, well, let's make the uh, gear fully retractable. So I engineered the, uh, the uh, retractable gear for drag reduction. Uh, I also uh, built it with the carbon wing skins and spars uh, for the higher speeds and the higher G loads. It does, does cruise, economy cruise. It's about 10 and a half gallons an hour at 200 knots. Uh, it's got a 1300 mile range plus reserves. Um, I have incorporated blended winglets into this airplane. Uh, and also uh, I have uh, tested it the, to a service ceiling of 25,000 feet. Uh, I did three of the Air Venture Cup races uh, for, uh, to Oshkosh and uh, my average speeds have always been in the, in the upper 260s and my best speed to date was 271 miles an hour over the uh, 500 mile uh, course. So uh, getting into uh, the airplanes that I built, uh, this one uh, in addition, uh, the HP-18 uh, sailplane. Uh, this one right here, I changed quite a few different things, added winglets, changed the uh, main airfoil on the uh, wing. Uh, I blew a canopy, I raised the turtle back, put a new nose on it, and also the addition of the twin turbines for self-launch and sustainer flight. So getting right into our subject matter here, the ASW-27, it's a 1997 ASW-27A. It was imported under the experimental and exhibition category, which was extremely important for me. That means a, uh, a builder like myself that does not have an a and license can go ahead and perform the repairs with FAA inspection supervision and documentation. When I went and looked at the airplane uh, with a friend of mine, it was in December a number of years ago out at Harris Hills, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we looked and it had a broken tail boom. There were some radial cracks in the forward fuselage. Uh, the landing gear system was basically uh, uh, pushed up and turned somewhat sideways. Um, but uh, the uh, primary elements of the airplane were all intact. Uh, the wings were good, the, the vertical stabilizer, the, the rudder, the horizontal stabilizer, the elevator, all of those things were in good shape. The canopy was still intact and the fuselage uh, pod was still intact. Uh, with these things wrong, it allowed me to pursue this project. And uh, I put a bid in on the AIG Salvage Aviation website and uh, won the bid. Uh, so all the repairs uh, were provided using Alexander Schleicher repair methods manual with the use of the OEM original equipment manufacturers materials. Uh, 
parts and layup schedule. Um, I had won the bid and I reached out to Alexander Schleicher and said, this is what I have. This is what I'm going, uh, my intention is to rebuild this. This is the experience that I have. These are the aircraft that I have. Can you help me? And about two weeks later, I got a call back from Rex Mays and he had gotten the directive from Alexander Schleicher to go ahead and assist me. So through uh, Rex Mays, I was able to order the OEM materials from Alexander Schleicher through Rex Mays and he gave me the uh, layup schedules uh, that I needed for the, uh, uh, for the performance that I was gonna prepare. So, and then of course, the last thing that uh, on the list here is the installation of the twin turbines for self-launch and sustainer flight. So getting right into it here, I uh, brought the airplane back. It was in uh, uh, between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, we had about a foot on the snow, foot of snow on the ground. So I made up a cart to uh, with some skis on it to get it into the basement. Uh, here's the intact uh, canopy. Uh, here's the fuselage setting on the side. That way I could access the landing gear box. And uh, here I am disassembling the, uh, the landing gear. The main landing gear was all intact. Uh, the rear lip was uh, broken away. But the most important thing, uh, excuse me, is that the uh, rear uh, side, the rear bulkhead, of landing gear box was intact. The other side of that bulkhead is where you have the mixer for the, uh, uh, the flaps and the uh, ailerons and the spoilers. Uh, if that bulkhead was gone, I, I wouldn't have pursued this aircraft. Uh, these are the damage components, the swing arm up on the top there that had a pretty good bend in it. There were a couple tabs that were bent. Uh, the uh, strut arms, I had, uh, uh, one good long one, one bent long one, one good short one, one bad short one. So I could use those to jig up and make uh, two more strut arms. The uh, shock towers, uh, one was good, one was bent. There were ball joints on the end of those shock towers and those had been sheared off. Uh, this is looking at the bottom of the uh, fuselage pod. Uh, it's hard to uh, see in the picture here, but the areas with a red circle around it, those were the radial cracks. So to start with, before you can do any work on the airplane, I had to uh, build up a bunch of cradle jigs and also a large, long, uh, flat table. I was building this in my, basically my garage, uh, which had a, a nice drain and I, it sloped down to the center. So the floor was not flat. So I ended up building a, uh, a table that was four feet wide and the length of the airplane. And that had to be straight and uh, without any warp and twist Otherwise, you really don't know where to start from. So here I was uh, dropping plumb bobs to get some data. Um, the saddles, I made the saddles oversized, then mixed up uh, micro balloons and epoxy and squashed, squashed each one of the uh, uh, sections. You can see the duct tape on there uh, that was used as mold release. Uh, this is the uh, broken tail boom. Uh, composites fail in compression much more so than they do in tension. So in the ground loop here, this was the side of compression and uh, you can see the large crack. It also had a large crack along the seam where the two fuselage uh, sections are joined together. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the repair was fairly large and fairly lengthy. Um, it wasn't a small one. I had to replace a fairly good section of that uh, tailbone. Uh, so in my basement, how, uh, how do I get to handle these airplanes? Uh, it's uh, fairly, uh, fairly heavy and uh, you certainly don't want to drop anything. So I had two ladders with an I-beam and a uh, uh, pulley system and a track and dolly uh, so I can uh, basically lift up the fuselages and drop them into the uh, saddles. So. A uh, number of years ago, I did a presentation down at um, the Chicago Glider Council in Illinois, and I ran into John DeRosa, who had an ASW-27. We got talking. He understood that uh, I had purchased this airplane, and I basically had everything, but the final solution was jigging up my jigs to a good fuselage so I could repeat that uh, on my project. 
to get everything straight and uh, uh, and sound. Uh, so this is John DeRosa's airplane. First thing I did is I uh, taped the, the fuselage with blue painter's tape, and then I put uh, duct tape on that. You don't want to put duct tape right onto your uh, painted surface or gel coat because it will it uh, can pull some of that off. And I made uh, parting banks and uh, laid up two clamshell molds, uh, one for each half of the uh, uh, fuselage. And there is a picture of the two clamshell molds. So uh, there's the old HP-18 on the left side and John DeRosa's airplane on the right side. And there I've got everything jigged up to John DeRosa's, what I call the master pattern or the uh, master fuselage, uh, which once again gave me uh, the solution for repairing uh, my damaged one. So there's all the jigs and whatnot. You can see on the very end, there's a taller jig and that is for the tail section. The two pins that you have and where you hook in the uh, horizontal stabilizer, uh, that's how I uh, jig the uh, uh, vertical tail section. So uh, there's my uh, broken uh, ASW27 fuselage going down into the jigs. And here I am starting to uh, cut away the sections uh, for the tailbone repairs. I used a, a router to give me uh, a nice straight uniform cuts. Uh, I wanted things to be as simple as possible, especially for fitting the new sections in. And here is the removal of the first side. And that was actually removing both sides. And I took the uh, mold that I took off of John DeRosa's, this is one half, put it onto the the fuselage and it was a spot on fit. Uh, I was real, real pleased with that. Uh, the only damage that I had internally was the push bolt tube was bent and I was able to uh, uh, cut out the section that was bent and uh, splice in a new piece, but the uh, rudder cables were good. The uh, pitot static system, uh, the total energy system, all of that was still intact. So here's the uh, forward fuselage uh, section. With the brake being so far forward, I was able to reach up into the fuselage, line it with quarter inch foam, uh, build up some bulkheads and start to uh, work on the production of a fuel cell. Uh, I can put the fuel cell on the wings, but my preference was to put it into the fuselage. Uh, before I went and did this, of course I went and did the uh, uh, arm and moment and weight and balance, uh, all the calculations to see if the fuel cell was actually going to work in the position that it was that that I was locating at, and uh, it was. So I, I moved forward. This is the uh, fuel cell right here. I had to cut it in four pieces because I had a reverse taper or backdraft, so I couldn't get it out of the fuselage without cutting it. Uh, there's a, another photo of it. It's all clicked together. Uh, this is looking inside the fuselage from the cockpit. Of course, looking at the spars, I got the wings assembled and there's the spar pins. So in this uh, picture here, you can also see that I have applied duct tape to the entire interior of the turtle deck. I went ahead and did a takeoff or a layup uh, on the inside of the turtle deck. And if you can see the uh, brown around the uh, inside of the turtle deck, I have that layup in there. On the spar, I put a quarter inch of foam and then duct tape over the foam and up onto the fuselage sides and turtle inside the uh, turtle deck and made a layup. And that's a saddle that you're looking at here. So what I'm trying to do is keep the relationship all sound between the spars, the, uh, uh, the saddle and the inside of the turtle deck. Uh, next thing is uh, making up some fairly simple uh, fabrications uh, for the retraction system. So a couple different weldments here. And I have uh, uh, the two weldments put together. Um, Armand, can, can you guys see my, uh, my uh, cursor? Yes, we can see your cursor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we see your yeah, we can okay. see it. Just, so I've got, uh, just I've got a pit. Good. There good, is a, good. So I've got a pivot point, point here, a pivot point here, another pivot point here. I, I'm sorry? Uh, just go on. So, there's okay. another tool you can so use. So I've got uh, four pivot points. Good. Uh, 
yeah, I've got a pivot point here and here and another pivot point here and up front. And what this, uh, this is a basically a flat apparatus that folds up as a parallelogram to an extended apparatus. And that is my extension and retraction system. Uh, so here I've got the sadder, uh, saddle. Uh, in the center, I have the uh, folded down extension retraction system and then the turbines on top. And this was a uh, double check to make sure that I had enough room in here uh, to actually install the turbines. Uh, everything was looking good. So uh, here it is on the bench. I've got the saddle, the extension retraction system, and the uh, pivot block in the back. And I'm creating a relationship uh, to see, uh, uh, make sure that everything is going to fit together. And I'm making all this as a bench top experiment and mock up and build before I go ahead and put it in the fuselage. So here's the uh, two turbines installed. And uh, once I was happy with all of that, uh, I uh, built up a uh, foam, uh, hot glued foam pieces together and installed all the mechanisms, clearanced everything out, made sure the turbines were gonna fit, that I had uh, clearance in the front, on the front of the turbines, back of the turbines, side of the turbines. I pulled all the mechanism out of there, applied duct tape and made what I call the turbine tub. So the turbine tub, is up on the left, then the saddle in the center, retraction uh, extension uh, mechanism here. And then this is the takeoff that I took from the inside of the uh, uh, turtle deck. Now I uh, clico this all together, started cutting out the top of the uh, takeoff from the turtle deck, uh, providing clearance, making sure everything was gonna work out on the bench. Uh, there the turbines are. And then I'm moving forward and starting to play around with the, um, with the doors uh, for the uh, engine bay. And uh, here the uh, doors are once again. And again, uh, the thing is with an experimental, you just don't know how this is gonna work. Uh, when the doors open and close, are they gonna be ripped off by the wind? Uh, are there gonna be significant side loads that won't allow them to open and close? Are they going to flutter? Uh, these are just things that you have to start to work through with your flight testing program. Um, here's a, another picture, basically a bench top model, the relationship between the turbine tub, the extension mechanism, and the linear actuator that goes down to the bottom of the fuselage. So uh, here's a, another uh, arm that I welded to uh, one of those weldments that will move the uh, mechanism up and down and a small bracket. And you can see the end of the linear actuator coming out to that bracket. Uh, moving forward, here is uh, uh, the first uh, rendition, the first mock-up of a linear actuator for the landing gear doors, or the, excuse me, the uh, engine bay doors. Uh, small pivot, uh, an arm and some push-pull tubes uh, going to the fulcrum on the, uh, on the door. So with all this in place, I felt confident uh, that I could go ahead and cut the hole in the turtle deck and get it in the right position and not make it too small and not make it too big. So the, uh, here's the uh, engine, uh, engine bay or the uh, turbine tub installed, uh, temporarily installed with the extension retraction mechanism. And that was the inside of the mock-up, or excuse me, inside layup of the uh, turtle deck uh, that is not now going to be the flange lip where the gear doors, or excuse me, engine bay doors will open and close. So uh, there it is starting to extend and fully extended position with the turbines in, in place. Um, the, uh, this is the uh, lip area, uh, which I'm getting is all roughed up. Uh, getting ready to bond that in. Uh, here I'm bonding it into the inside of the uh, turtle deck and also adding a number of additional layers to stiffen that entire area up. So here's the turbine tub once again, and here are the uh, engine bay doors. And en engine bay doors are opening and closing. And uh, there's the extension mechanism extended. And this is my backup right here. If I was going to be getting uh, a flutter in those engine bay doors, or if they were just gonna get ripped off the airplane or who knows what, 
I can extend the turbine and put a top hat door that connects right to the top of the turbine that'll go up and down with the engine. Now that would work fine, but it also leaves a large drag bucket and the door, top hat door onto the top of the turbines, I would have to do some engineering because the hot section, the exhaust area is very, very close to that uh, uh, top hat door. So uh, I was very pleased that, that the uh, uh, regular uh, engine bay doors worked and I didn't have to go with this solution here. So uh, here are the uh, two molds that I took off from the clamshell. Of course, that had the imprint from all the duct tape. So I had to mud this all up with filler, sand it all down and prime it up. And this is the uh, matrix of all the material that is used, uh, all OEM material from Alexander Schleicher that goes into each one of these clamshell uh, uh, pieces. You have uh, E-glass with unidirectional and bidirectional different weights. You have carbon fiber, unidirectional, bidirectional different weights. You have Kevlar. Um, it is, I just don't know how they came across, uh, you know, they did their engineering. I'm not questioning it, but uh, there's a lot of materials that really don't complement each other, but I guess they work out just fine and uh, for, for, uh, for the sail plane. Um, here's the uh, mold. Uh, once I did uh, my first layup, I've got peel ply in here and then a bleeder material and then the uh, plastic and I vacuum bagged each one of my layups. Uh, there are the uh, two clamshell pieces uh, before they are trimmed up. And here are the molds uh, with everything trimmed up. So uh, one of the ideas that I had is I put the clamshell molds onto the fuselage and I scribed a line on where all my uh, joints were. And then when I went ahead and made the uh, two new uh, fuselage clam, uh, clamshells, uh, I had that scribe line on there. So I was able to trim right up against those and it made the fitting really, really easy. So uh, here's uh, the first section in place. Uh, you can see the joint in the back side of the fuselage and the joint uh, towards the front side of the fuselage. Uh, they were basically a spot on match. Um, here, this picture shows the, uh, the two molds and then the uh, two takeoffs or the two pieces that I'm uh, using in the fuselage. Uh, this is the left hand side of the fuselage. Once again, a nice spot on fit. And uh, now I'm switching gears here we have the fuel cell. Uh, fuel cell, I uh, uh, laid up a small aluminum uh, piece in the bottom, which uh, was tapped for a quarter inch NPT. I put a quick disconnect fitting in there. Uh, the rubber hose goes to a, a fuel filter and then a fuel pump. And then the other end of that gets hooked into a, a header tank. And the header tank is actually incorporated into this tank right here. Uh, you can see uh, the fuel valve right here. This is the outlet, uh, on off valve, and then this is the distribution uh, block, manifold block that goes to each of the turbines. So the header tank is on this end and it fills up with fuel all the way to the top. So my pressure differential from the top of the tank to the turbines is only about seven inches. If I was trying to draw fuel from the very bottom of the tank and push it up into the turbines, that is such a long draw that it would create a low pressure system and actually start to introduce air into the fuel lines. Uh, picture, uh, uh, you know, taking a straw and drinking from a cup, that's not a problem. But if you, if you stand up and, and take a, a, a four foot straw and try to draw that from in that distance, uh, it's very, very difficult. So here we are looking inside of the tank. I've got the uh, uh, fuel probe uh, top of the tank. That's my uh, uh, filler neck. Uh, another thing that was damaged was the uh, seat pan. Uh, the area that is outlined with the magic marker had to be replaced. That was all damaged. So uh, I uh, cut out the damaged area. But prior to cutting out the damaged area, I duct taped the inside of the uh, seat pan and did a takeoff. Uh, so I had a plug. I took that plug, I mudded it all up with a Bondo, smoothed everything all out. And then I could put that plug back into the uh, seat pan 
and use that for my first layup. So this lamp was on the bottom side of the uh, seat pan. Here it is roughed up and then I did a layup on this side so everything is all sandwiched together. Uh, this picture shows the uh, turbine tub. Um, so just a quick explanation on how this all works. I have limit switches that show me when the extension retraction system is down and locked and up and locked. I also have limit switches that show when the gear, the engine bay doors are open and closed. So the sequence is open up the gear doors, uh, the engine bay doors, extend the turbine, and then close the engine bay doors. When the engine bay doors close, it triggers this linear actuator right here, which extends a pin. And when the mechanism is extended, it has a plate and the pin goes through the plate, so it locks everything in the up position. If I would uh, strip off uh, the teeth on the gears when the engines would be running, uh, this prevents the turbines from retracting when the engines would be running. Uh, that would not be a good thing. So when this pin, all, uh, pin also extends, it hits this micro switch right here, which then allows in, uh, the uh, electricity to go to the engine control units. So if the engines are not up and if the doors are not closed and if this pin is not in place, I am, un I am unable to start those engines. Uh, here's another picture looking in. I've uh, uh, put in the uh, intermediate uh, damage. I took out the damaged area on the push bolt tube and installed a uh, uh, new section there. Now this is starting to show the uh, scarfing. This is really, really dirty work. And uh, I had a full Tyvek suit on, uh, the glasses, respirator. Um, I did all of this basically top down. Uh, so I didn't have to get on a, a, a creeper underneath the fuselage when everything's falling into your ear, you know, your ears and uh, eyes and things of that sort. Um, it's pretty, you know, it, it, it was actually quite a lengthy deal, pretty complex. Uh, as far as I, as I was concerned. Um, I also decided, well, let's go ahead since I'm uh, handy and uh, in the composite mode, I uh, pulled out the instrument panel, filled it all in and made a master and uh, made a, uh, uh, a master mold off of that, vacuum bagging everything in. This is actually switching back to the fuselage, one of the uh, uh, scarf joints that I had laid up uh, showing the uh, uh, vacuum bagging uh, operation, pulling uh, 27 inches of mercury, uh, which is actually very good. Uh, so there is the first joint, uh, all scarfed out and laid up. I did the two longitudinal joints before I did the uh, radial joints. Uh, here's moving back to the uh, fuselage. This is actually pulling out the first instrument panel out of the mold. I uh, made a number of those uh, because I know as time goes on, I'm going to be updating my panel. Uh, here I have done the uh, uh, radial scarfing and a layup, and I have the uh, vacuum bagging around this and uh, uh, pulling the, the vacuum to give it a good sound structure. And this picture shows the longitudinal uh, scarfs and repairs and also the radial uh, scarf areas and repairs. Uh, so it actually takes up uh, quite a bit of area. Uh, this one right here, I'm just going to zoom in for a moment. You can see where I've got a joint here and a joint here and a joint here and a joint here and a joint here. These are all the different layers that went in uh, with the different uh, matrix to uh, go ahead and uh, provide the repairs. Forward fuselage on the bottom side, we had those radial cracks. I uh, scarfed those areas out and went ahead and uh, did my repair layups and vacuum bag that. This is my vacuum pump. Uh, it's actually a uh, refrigerator compressor. I think I bought it for about 25 or $30 about 30 years ago and it uh, uh, still works great. Uh, with the uh, addition of the twin turbines and self-launch, I have to taxi out onto the runway from the uh, taxiway and whatnot. So I made a steerable tailwheel. 
Um, the tail wheel, the yoke, and the spindle are all from an RV6. Uh, these are the fairly simple components that I had welded up. I also uh, included a Danley die spring to give it a, a shock absorber. And uh, these are two takeoffs from inside the uh, wheel well on the aircraft. Uh, so here I've got the, uh, uh, I was able to use the main bolt here and uh, a couple different uh, fastening structures inside. Uh, but here is the uh, yoke and uh, spindle. Um, here's a picture looking at the repairs and the uh, turbines and another uh, front view of the turbines looking back and the repairs behind it. Uh, these are the repairs on the bottom of the fuselage. Uh, another photo of that. And uh, now I have to uh, go ahead and do a post cure to bring the mechanical properties of all the repair areas up to the uh, up to spec, up to the uh, ASW uh, uh, requirements. So I built a box uh, out of foam. I put a, a, a fan in here. I have uh, uh, two heat lamps go inside uh, the box. So the air is circulating around, close everything up. And I used a electronic thermostat uh, with a low limit of 130 and a high limit of 140. Uh, so it would bring it up to 140, it would turn the uh, heat lamps off, go down to 130, and then recycle up, turn them back on, recycle to 140. I did that uh, for 12 hours, and uh, that brought the uh, mechanical properties up to uh, what was needed. Um, of course, with the turbines and whatnot, uh, new instrument panel, uh, things get a little bit busier. I'm starting on some of the wiring and whatnot. Uh, there was wiring in the back. Uh, without the turbine tub in there, you have access to all your mixers, your, your linkages for the uh, flaps and the spoilers and the ailerons. Um, it actually is pretty nice when you go and do a condition inspection because you can get right down to it right in there. Uh, so here's the instrument panel once again that I'm uh, starting to install. I have it pulled out, painted up flat black. Uh, now I'm getting ready to move on to the uh, finishing. So I... Uh, uh, welded up, had a friend do the welding. I cut it all up, I'm not the welder. An uh, octagon rollover device. I can turn this over in 45 degree increments. Um, turn the fuselage over, uh, put the box on top of the areas that I had repaired and uh, did my post cure just like I did on the uh, tail boom. Um, now I've got the, uh, this tail wheel standing out quite a ways. I need to fare that all in. So I uh, glued together some foam blocks, uh, went ahead, carved that all up, put duct tape over the top of that, uh, installed the tail wheel, make sure that I had proper clearance and whatnot. And I did my layup and then I mudded that all up with micro balloons and uh, epoxy uh, mixture, uh, sanded it all down and came up with a, uh, uh, a fairly pleasing uh, uh, cosmetic cover. Uh, did the same thing with the tail boom, uh, the micro balloons uh, uh, with epoxy slurry and uh, blocked and, and uh, spline sanded that all down. And the same thing with the radial repairs on the front side. So uh, with all this in place, uh, then I put the uh, suit back on. I used an alternate air supply from a different room. It's a squirrel cage that gives me a positive air pressure. And I did the uh, priming and sanding and filling and priming and sanding and filling. Uh, here are the uh, engine bay doors. There's the uh, instrument panel and the rear fa uh, fairing. Uh, the rollover jig really works well for this because you're always doing, doing things from the top side down. Uh, this is all wet sanded down to 320 grit. If you get it any smoother than that, say if you go to 500 grit, um, your paint will not stick. Um, so the 320, I actually should have probably stopped at about 280, um, but uh, uh, worked out real nice I'm trying to get everything all prepped up for paint. Once I was happy with that, I put the roller over jig on a uh, dolly and the tail jig on a, on a dolly and they was able to uh, roll that outside and get everything all set up. I do my painting uh, outside. I have tried to paint an airplane inside and uh, it wafts up through the house and uh, I got a, you don't have a happy wife when that happens. 
So uh, I always do my painting in the late fall or the early spring uh, when we don't have pollen, we don't have mosquitoes and bugs. You still get some imperfections uh, from uh, particulates in the air, but uh, I put the paint on heavy enough uh, to where I can go back and wet sand most that out and get just about everything out. So getting everything all prepped up and uh, there's white paint. I used a PPG acrylic urethane uh, very, very durable uh, material. It's what the sailplane uh, uh, rebuilders and all the shops use also. Um, I got the paint colors from, uh, um, uh, uh, who's the place? Uh, out in, uh, out east at uh, uh, Harris Hills. Um, and uh, uh, so I was off, off and running. Uh, what I, I'm not a professional painter. I do a pretty good job, but I do, don't do a great job. Uh, so once again, I put it on pretty heavy. What I end up with is I'm not, I don't get runs and sags, but what I do get is orange peel. And so I, when I move everything back into the shop, I have to wait a minimum of four days, probably five days, but you don't want to wait a month to do this because the paint is curing, and uh, after four or five days, it'll cut real well. If you wait a month, it's going to be hard as nails. So I uh, take a pencil and I go and I scribble up the entire fuselage. Then I come back with a spline and a block and start sanding everything down with a thousand grit. And uh, once I start getting about 90% of the orange peel uh, is, is removed, it's all blocked down, then I switch to 1500 grit. Uh, that pretty much takes it all the way down. So I've got a nice uniform finish and then I'll end up with 2000 grit. From there, you can go with your finesse buffing compound, uh, the brown, com brown compound for, for which is cutting and then the white compound, which is uh, for uh, buffing. And you end up with a pretty much of a mirror finish when you're all finished up. So, um, these pictures are at Waukesha Airport where I have my uh, uh, power plane stored. This is assembled and these pictures were sent in to the FAA. Um, I had requested a aircraft registration a number of times during the build and then they denied it. They said this airplane in their mind was a salvage, it was a wreck, it was going to the boneyard and it probably wasn't ever going to fly again. So by the, uh, what I had to do was finally get it to this stage, all assembled together, sent them these final pictures and they uh, granted me a aircraft uh, registration. So um, that's where things are at. Uh, I flew it about 135 hours last year and I'm hoping to do uh, uh, even more so this year. It's a great airplane. Uh, I like the ability of self-launch. I can take off and fly to where the lift is. Uh, I can restart them in the air, use them for sustainer flight. Um, it has uh, turned out to be a, a pretty nice machine and I'm pretty happy with it. So uh, there we go. Uh, uh, if uh, there's any questions, uh, I'd be uh, glad to uh, help out here. Uh, Chris, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, sure. Uh, how much does how much does it weigh um, after everything is said and done? The uh, when I bought the airplane in the uh, registration, it showed that it was five hundred and fifty six pounds. Between the installation of the turbines, the supporting equipment, the fuel system, the steerable tailwheel. Um, doing all the, uh, uh, as I say, fuselage repairs and giving everything new paint, which was fuselage and wings, and it ended up being 605 pounds. So it was an addition of about 50 pounds. That's still quite a bit lighter than my Amish glider. <laughs> um, what, what kind of static uh, thrust do you get at sea level? And what kind of climb rates do you get at uh, sea level? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good point, because I fly uh, in Wisconsin, which is basically just under 1,000 feet. Uh, each engine puts out 67 and a half pounds. I've got a total of 135 pounds. Uh, when I take off in Wisconsin, I'll take off with a ground roll of about 1,200 feet, 
and I'll be able to climb at about uh, five to 550 feet per minute. Uh, out here, um, you know, you take your rule of thumb for every thousand feet, you're adding another, what is it, 10%? So uh, I'm, I'm basically at least doubling my takeoff roll out here and my climb rate uh, suffers a little bit, but it's still, uh, uh, it still works pretty good. Especially down in Moriarty here, uh, we've got a long runway. Uh, if you can get one favorable with a little bit of headwind, uh, by the time I uh, take off from the threshold of the runway uh, to the staging area, I'm usually off the ground. By the time I get to the end of the runway, I think I've got about uh, maybe three, 350 feet. What kind of range do you get out of it? The range is not great. Uh, these turbines are very thirsty. You know, the lightweight compactness uh, doesn't uh, necessarily trans over it to uh, fuel economy. So I have a uh, quantity of nine gallons of fuel. And uh, at full tilt on takeoff with both turbines going uh, a full tilt, which is 105,000 RPM. These turbines are uh, idle at 33,000 RPM. I'll be burning a gallon every two minutes. Uh, so uh, the, essentially, you know, the idea is let's get it off the ground. And as soon as you find your first thermal, I'll bring them back to idle, get myself centered, make sure I have a positive climb rate, climb rate and then I'll shut them down. Um, that can be as little as, you know, 12, 1500 feet above the ground. Um, if things are not strong, I'll go up to a 3000 foot, uh, I'll do a 3000 foot climb, uh, basically uh, bring them down to idle, uh, shut them down and uh, find my thermal from there. Uh, with the sustainers, since uh, I don't have to light up both engines to uh, sustain flight, I can light up both engines if I need to do an, another climb. But if I am just doing a sustainer, I can light up one engine and that will double my uh, uh, fuel endurance. But you, you can't plan on flying for an hour uh, with nine gallons of fuel. Uh, it, 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 they're too, too thirsty. Uh, you're going to go through your fuel pretty good. The sustainer is good to get back to your airport if you're close enough. Otherwise, it's going to get you to a favorable landing area or, a, uh, uh, or another airport. All right, any other questions this evening? Well, this is Bob speaking. I was just going to, uh, to mention that uh, you can get some of the feel for Chris's work product by watching his presentation, but to look at the actual finished product is uh, impressive. Uh, he is really a craftsman and it's beautiful. I've seen both of his gliders and uh, uh, the, HP 18 as well as the ASW 27. And he is just a craftsman. They are beautiful. Well, thank you, Bob. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, it's very flattering. That is some good workmanship. <laughs> I was curious uh, about lift drag, like, uh, you know, I don't know what the airplane had, you know, from the original airplane, but then what you think you had with, with the engines hanging out there. And then uh, uh, what would be, what would the situation be if, say, the engines were were out hanging out in the wind, but for some reason could not, you know, were not running and could not be retracted? You know, say a mechanical issue. I, uh, I, you know, it's it, this is this is just my opinion here, but I think the uh, the frontal air of the engines is probably somewhat similar to leaving your landing gear extended. Um, so it uh, it might be a little bit draggier. But uh, there's uh, been, you know, when I shut these engines down, I have the engine control units. And since the engines are coming back into the fuselage, I will uh, let them cool down to where they're basically around 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, so they're nice and cool. Well, that cool down period can take, you know, 45 seconds to a minute. 
there is not much mass with these engines. They're so small, so they do cool down quite quickly. And uh, with the uh, since they're extended, uh, the turbines just freewheel when they're shut down, and it keeps pumping air through those engines. So, um, so uh, uh, yeah, once uh, once I uh, uh, in the cool down cycle, um, sometimes I'll forget about that, and next thing I know, I'm thermaling. And I'm going, well, geez, what's all this extra noise? Then I realize I still have the engines up and then uh, tuck them away. And uh, then that cleans up, cleans everything up. But I, I think it is somewhat similar to say, leaving your landing gear down. Did the uh, FAA would you want to allow the air conditioning? You know, since I had, uh, see Bob, uh, Carlton kind of paved the way. It's a, what is it? 3204-2H, I think it was. Uh, and that was for the turbines. I don't, I didn't need a type rating uh, for a glider. And the specific reason is it's an aircraft instead of an airplane. So it does not, the turbine rating does not apply to an aircraft. Uh, so he had that rewritten. Um, and I, he paved the way, so I utilized that on the HP-18. And since they had done it for the HP-18, I had the uh, same uh, uh, examiner come out and take a look at the ASW-27, and he didn't question it. So uh, uh, thank goodness to uh, uh, Bob Carlton, uh, getting that all squared away. Otherwise, I might be getting a type rating in a, uh, uh, who knows, some type of corporate jet. And uh, uh, really uh, would rather not do that. All right. Uh, Armand, uh, anything else we need to cover here? <laughs> Armin, hello. Well, Chris, on another issue, um, how's the flying been in Moriarty? It has been pretty poor, Bob. <laughs> well, I got I got up yesterday, and uh, uh, the uh, had a fun flight. Didn't go that far. Uh, I think we we're capped out at like fourteen five. Uh, today it just filled in. There have been people here for uh, uh, two weeks, and uh, they've only gotten three flights. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, things have not been real robust. Um, they don't look good for the next couple of days. Uh, we're hoping that things will improve this next week. Okay. I, uh, okay. <laughs> I sure had a fun flight in, uh, in Boulder though, uh, getting up on top of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, crest, the continental divide there and, uh, seeing all these places that, uh, I know from the ground, especially the ski areas and Grand Lake and Longs Peak and, uh, uh, going down, you know, uh, south of Mount Evans and, uh, Breckenridge area. Uh, it was just delightful. Okay, well, yeah. I'm, I'm planning on heading out to uh, to rifle uh, probably on about the 10th, and uh -huh. uh, then we'll be continuing on to Moria. Uh, excuse me, to Parowan from there. So, we'll all probably right, we see you at one place or the other. You bet. Yeah, I'll uh, definitely see you out at uh, at Parowan there. I'm. Uh, Going to stick it out here. Uh, Steve uh, D has uh, gone back home for a family reunion, but he'll be coming out next week on Tuesday. So we'll have all of next week to fly, and then we'll uh, we'll head to Utah from here. Great. Great. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing here, and uh, let's see. Armand, I think we're all set. Well, Chris, thanks. That was uh, that was great. Um, and uh, does uh, anybody have uh, uh, any questions for Chris? 
Um, Chris, you, you mentioned uh, that glider was a, uh, uh, the one you bought, the, the, the SW27 was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, experimental. How big a deal would it be if, if it had yes. been, if it had been certified, could you redo it as, could you change it to experimental and do something like that with a certified glider? I understand that you can change the certification to experimental. I don't know how difficult that would be. Um, my key was when I talked to the FAA, told them my ideas on, on what I was doing here, buying the glider as a salvage, uh, changing it, doing all these modifications. The first thing he said is, what category is it? And I said, Exper yeah. experimental, and they said, well, you are free to do what you want to with the experimental, but a certified aircraft, there would have probably been some pretty big hurdles to, uh, to jump through. Anybody else uh, have anything to talk about on this? Somebody say something? Well, thank you uh, all for, yeah, all thank right. you all for attending. And uh, I guess that'll wrap it up. I'd announce next week's, but uh, this was a special one, not uh, not part of the weekly series that we had a while back. So um, at any rate, Chris, thanks so much. Everybody, thanks for attending. Uh, if there's no more discussion, we'll just uh, call it right here. So thanks so much, Chris. And uh Sounds great. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Yep. Good night now. Thank you. Thanks, Chris.